Assistant Minister of Education. Questions uh, 1 and 3 have been withdrawn, and I call Mr Trevor Clark. Mr Clark. Question number 2. What is it? The Executive has not yet come to an agreed position on welfare reform, neither has it agreed to remove £30 million from the education budget. Mr. Clark, for supplement. Uh, I thank the Minister for that very short answer, but it has been well, well publicised that it is anticipated that the Minister of Finance is suggesting that £30 million could be removed from the education budget. And given the circumstances where it may be possible happening, has the Minister put any thoughts in terms of what parts of education would suffer in loss, the loss of £30 million? Well, I personally think our energies, which we have much better used in dealing with uh, the British Government and relaying to the British Government the detrimental impact that welfare reform will have on our society and our community, than anticipating figures or speculating on figures that may or may not come out of my budget or any other departmental budget. So um, I can assure the member that um, I will continue to manage my budget efficiently and effectively. Uh, and deliver services to uh, our education across the board. And I will continue to, along with my colleagues, uh, to resist the current welfare reform and to ensure that we get a fair deal for, our, for the most vulnerable people in our society. Call Mr. Mickey Brady. I got uh, pre last I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Given the clear link between disadvantage and poor education and outcomes, can I ask the Minister to comment on the potential impact? of the proposed welfare reform bill on our young people? Uh, it has been widely reported that the proposals under welfare reform will have a major impact uh, upon our society, particularly the most vulnerable in our society and those on the lowest income levels in our society, both those who are working uh, poor and those who are currently not working for a variety of reasons. Uh, a number of surveys have been carried out, including the Institute of Fiscal Studies. The Institute for Fiscal Studies concluded that by 2020-21, as a result of the tax and benefit changes, which includes those proposed under the welfare, welfare reform agenda, relative child poverty and absolute children's poverty here are projected to rise by 7.5% 7, 7 and 10.4 uh, percentage points, uh, respectively. And that in itself will have an impact upon the educational well-being of young people in our society and their educational outcomes for our entire society. So I think it's only right and proper that serious concerns have been raised about welfare reform, not only its immediate impact, but its long-term impact uh, upon our young people. And I call uh, Dolores Kelly. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I welcome uh, the Minister's comments uh, to date. Uh, Minister, uh, you refer to many of our most marginalised and people uh, in receipt of unemployment benefit. You will also, I'm sure, acknowledge the fact that there is rising levels of poverty amongst the working poor. Therefore, will you uh, continue your efforts to ensure that funding is secure, to ensure that schools not only provide education but help in the well-being of our young people and help with the affordable childcare through the breakfast clubs? and after school clubs? Uh, well, when I, I refer to uh, poverty among our society and deprivation in our society, there's clearly those and a growing number within society who are, wor who are working and are able to uh, achieve and, and pay uh, many of, of the bills that are, that are bearing down upon them. I have made changes to free school meals entitlement, raised uh, or lowered the level of uh, required for entitlement free school meals. I will continue to examine other ways of assisting those who are not only unemployed but those who are on benefits such as family tax credits, etc., to ensure that they access greater support uh, from our schools. Many of our schools are benefiting from programmes such as the Extended Schools programme. Many of those schools do run uh, breakfast clubs, after schools clubs, etc. And my recent changes to the common funding formula will allow schools, and particularly socially deprived areas, to increase those programmes of work as well. Call Mr. Michael Copeland. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, um, and I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Um, can the Minister uh, give us an assurance that the most disadvantaged pupils in our education system will not up, end up paying the price should the predictions of doom emanating from some of his, his executive colleagues prove to be correct? Well, it's quite clear, even from the report I've read out, that the most disadvantaged in our society will suffer if we introduce the current welfare reform legislation. That is the reality of the situation. Those are independent figures, 
and anyone who wishes to examine what is, is happening in England as a result of welfare reform will know only too well what the detrimental impact will be. So my view is, instead of speculating on what may or may not be taken from budgets, that as an executive we approach the British government in a united for form and press the gov British government to alleviate uh, the most damaging parts of the welfare reform bill, therefore ensuring that our society has a secure basis upon which to move forward. Mr. Paul Given. Question number four, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The proportion of pupils who leave year 14 without completing their courses or exams is small. In 2012-13, 231, 1.7% of the 13,766 pupils who were studying post-16 qualifications withdrew from school during year 14. Year 13 com comprises a range of pupils, including those who are completing GCSEs or equivalent qualifications, and those who are in the first year of the post-16 qualifications. It is not currently possible for the Department to identify the numbers of young people who begin and then withdraw from a course of study during year, year 13. Work is underway to develop new data sources that will provide this information in the future. Available data shows that over half of those leaving school at the end of year 13, 57%, take up places in FE colleges, with a further 27% moving on to training or employment. Young people who see their time in education as relevant to their future, who have access to courses that interest and motivate them, are more likely to remain engaged with their education and achieve their full potential. This is why I have introduced the requirements of the entitlement framework. Effective and timely careers guidance is also important when they are supported by timely, high-quality careers education, information, advice and guidance. Young people are more likely to, to make informed choices. That is what will help them decide on and commit to finishing courses when they can see exactly where their courses can take them and lead to. Can I thank the Minister for that response and encourage him to uh, expedite the uh, data sources uh, to give him the information about the number of pupils that leave or withdraw during year 13? Certainly the evidence in speaking to uh, my own further college, education college is that they are having to uh, pick up a number of pupils that leave during year 13. Uh, and given that there does seem to be an issue, uh, what uh, consideration is there uh, to provide additional support to schools so the children, once they complete their GCSEs, are being properly placed in the right academic uh, type of work that they wish to continue with? Well, I uh, thank the member uh, for that question. And I am also aware of anecdotal evidence uh, from speaking to the further higher education sector uh, in relation to children or young adults at that stage dropping out uh, of year 13. And I, I can assure them that we are working towards gathering that data. Uh, in a more uniform manner. Um, I think the, the key to it is ensure that the proper careers advice is given at the correct time in, in, in the young person's educational pathway. And quite recently, myself and the Minister for Employment and Learning launched a careers review. And I think that will assist us in ensuring that we have the right advice at the right time for young people so they do choose the right career pathway, whether that be academic or otherwise, and they do know where their courses are going to lead, lead to. So it ensures that we retain more and more young people uh, in, in our education system and they do qualify uh, going into the future. Call Ms. Sandra Overland. Uh, thank you very much. And the, the Minister has more or less uh, answered my question, but I will just develop that on through that you know, I do believe that there does need to be a, a, a robust system of scrutiny to, to track why uh, year 13s especially and 14s are withdrawn from education. But does the Minister agree that um, work needs to be done uh, earlier on uh, in previous years in the school to try and uh, you know, bring forward that, the idea of, of where, the, where their young people need to go and how the education is there to help them to develop their career? Uh, I do agree with you. Uh, and careers advice should not be a one-off event. Uh, it should be a part of the uh, young person's educational pathway and development as, as they progress through post-primary school and choices are coming up to them, and particularly as they advance towards their GCSEs and what subjects to study in GCSEs. So I think the, the careers review we have launched along with Minister Farry, uh, and it's an independent review and they have a very wide remit uh, and an independent uh, remit as well. And I would hope that they come back to us with uh, imaginative suggestions and new suggestions uh, and learn from the best practice, whether it's here or in other jurisdictions, to ensure that young people are given the correct advice at the correct time 
during their educational pathway. And I call Mr. Chris Little. Question number five. I have said many times that our education system continues to fail too many young people. The attainment gaps are simply unacceptable, and we are working hard to tackle this inequality. In 2011 12, a total of 1,151 Protestant young people entitled to free school meals left our schools. Of those, 853 did not attain the benchmark of five or more GCSEs at grade A star to C or equivalent, including English and maths. That represents 74.1% of that cohort. For the Catholics, there was a total of 2,524 young people with free school meals entitlement that left in 2011 2012. Of these, 1,552 left without the benchmark, representing 61.5% of that cohort. The evidence shows that pupils from disadvantaged backgrounds have greater obstacles to overcome. Their schools need additional resources to help them to do this. And last month, I announced changes to the way schools are funded in order to target additional resources at schools serving high proportions of disadvantaged pupils. I have kept a clear focus on improving outcomes. I have continued to implement policies and provide funding for a range of additional interventions which, with a focus on improving standards and tackling educational underachievement. Despite improving outcomes at all stages, the gap between those from socially disadvantaged backgrounds and other pupils remains. The message from the international evidence is clear. A socially balanced education system enables all pupils to perform better. While some of our schools persist in the use of academic selection, we will be unable to eradicate this social division. Inequality in outcomes is a societal issue and one that education authorities and schools cannot tackle on their own. The challenge of tackling inequalities, uh, the key to education, uh, sorry, the, the challenge of tackling inequalities, be they educational, health or economic, is one that we all face, and success will depend on all stakeholders working together in order to achieve greater equity in our society. Again, Mr. Little for a supplement. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his response. Can I ask the Minister whether he can give the House an uh, idea of specific interventions that he is bringing forward to tackle economic and cultural barriers to higher uh, education achievement, particularly amongst Protestant working class boys? And indeed, uh, would he be willing to meet with the East Belfast Education Working Group that is endeavouring to bring principals, parents, community and voluntary sector? Uh, and elected reps together to coordinate a better approach to education in the area? Well, I, I mentioned uh, in my response one of the most significant interventions I have made, and that's changing the common funding formula and diverting more money towards those schools in socially disadvantaged than those schools which are not in socially disadvantaged areas. And the member may re recall the lack of support in this House for that measure and the fierce resistance I met from certain political parties and individuals in relation to that matter. Indeed, I was threatened to be brought to court uh, by the DUP if I proceeded with the process. And as the member, as the member, as the member preempts me, I am also aware that they may be still considering to bring me to court for diverting more money. Uh, diverting, Yes, as we uh, stop the laughter and joking from the other side as we talk about social disadvantage in Protestant communities, uh, they may still be contemplating bringing me to court uh, to prevent more money going to socially deprived schools. So, square that circle. You know? how, do, how, how, how do I, as Education Minister, uh, then move forward in ensuring that policies that are required to eradicate uh, barriers to good education in socially deprived communities can be moved forward? Uh, in those circumstances. In terms of other measures I have put in place, I have ensured that the entitlement framework is brought to fore within our schools. The entitlement framework allows children from all abilities and all backgrounds to access relevant courses which they will enjoy, which they can contribute to, and which they see an outcome for in terms of career uh, pathways. And I have also ensured that, and I mentioned this to a previous question, in relation to uh, extended schools funding. I have ensured extended schools funding continues as well. But the key, and there is no one event which will solve this problem. It has to be multi-dimensional, it has to be multifunctional, and we do require the support of parents, pupils, the teachers and communities to eradicate educational underachievement. And I call Mr Robin Newt. 
Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers uh, so far. And also I make no apologies uh, for opposing the common funding formula on the basis of the number of schools that were going to be disadvantaged uh, 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 through that formula. And, and he knows that that did not just come from DUP benches, that other political parties also uh, opposed it. The question was, Minister, how much money are you going to invest to address this problem, which is a problem which has been identified in report after report after report, and indeed uh, requires a, an answer on specific investment to address the problem. But you had also made a comment about the uh, entitlement Let's framework, and that it. was part of your solution. Is it not the case that you are actually going to reduce the amount of money available under the entitlement framework? And that. Well, where, where does the member suggest I get the money? I have a global budget which I have to use to the best of my ability and direct it where I believe is necessary. So I can use, it, I can use the money uh, to continue the status quo as the members' party suggested, even though it resulted in greater disadvantage in socially deprived communities uh, and, and will continue to do that. Or I would change how I use the money and redirect funds towards those schools that most need it. That's what I done. I carried out a consultation. I, I, I done that. And yet, and all, the, mem and the members' own constituency, in terms of East Belfast, benefited from the common funding formula. The schools significantly benefited in your constituency as a result of the changes I made and you opposed. I made the changes, you opposed them, schools in your constituency benefited. So they did. In terms of the entitlement framework, the entitlement framework was also opposed by the DUP. Also opposed by the DUP. But the entitlement framework is seen as key in ensuring that all young people have access to a wide range of courses which meets and challenges their abilities. And the entitlement framework is key, especially to those young people who are not academically gifted but are gifted in other ways. It's key to them. But if I had to follow the DUP's advice on that one, I wouldn't have introduced the entitlement framework. But I did, and schools and communities that you serve are benefiting from it. In relation to the funding for the entitlement framework, I face a very difficult budget. I have committed to funding uh, 4.5 million to the entitlement framework in the time ahead. I will continue to review my budget, and if I can secure funding for the entitlement framework, I will. And I call Mr. Danny Kinahan. Very much, uh, Vice Principal Speaker. And I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Um, slightly ducked the question that came from Mr. Little, but what multidimensional approaches? Are there any pilot schemes that the Minister is looking at to put into areas where education is particularly struggling and is he liaising with the OFM, DFM for any projects that they might be doing on the same? Well, I, I, I don't accept that I dodged Mr. Little's question, though I, I didn't respond to the point about meeting the East Belfast Partnership, and I'm more than happy to meet the East Belfast Partnership. Uh, in relation to that matter, more than happy to do so, because I believe community involvement in education is vital if we are to succeed. So I have no difficulty in doing that whatsoever. In relation to pilot projects, um, there, there is a number of projects which OFM DFM are funding currently, along with the Department of Education. We have the Nurture Unit project, for instance, in primary schools, and we have the newly qualified teachers, over, uh, somewhere in the region, nearly 300 newly qualified teachers injected into our schools as a result of collaboration between the Department of Education and OFM DFM, which is a sign of when the executive works well uh, together, it works well for our society. It might be a wee lesson uh, for the executive within that. In relation to further pilot schemes, I, I'm not, uh, there, there's no secret to success here. The, 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 the secrets is known what you need to do. right? We need strong leadership within our schools, and we need to support the strong leadership within our schools, and that includes boards of governors and senior management teams. We need good teachers in the classroom. We need community and parental involvement uh, in, in the schools, and there need to be allowed community and parental involvement in our schools. And we need to eradicate academic selection. It is socially divisive. It, it separates young people on the basis of a very, very uh, iffy educational basis, if there is any educational basis in it whatsoever. It is more of a socio-economic basis upon which our children are, are separated. And when you look at successful education systems around the world, 
they have all done away with academic selection. And why did they do away with academic selection? Because they recognised that schools with a socio-economic mix and a schools with an all-ability mix do much better than selective schools anywhere. Order, order. I call Mr. Patsy McGlone. Uh, Gurma, I got a free old last young caller. Cash never is Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number six. Uh, the minimum enrolment threshold outlined in the Sustainable Schools Policy is just one of six criteria used to assess, to assess school sustainability. Sustainability is based on quality educational experience, stable enrolment trends, strong financial position, strong leadership and management, accessibility, strong links with the community. Therefore, the minimum enrolment threshold alone does not have an impact on rural primary schools. The enrolment of a school is not a trigger for automatic closure, but rather for a review of the school's sustainability. The Sustainable Schools Policy recognises the particular needs of rural communities, and this is reflected in the minimum enrolment threshold of 105 pupils for rural primary schools and in the accessibility criterion, which provides guidance on home to school travel times. The focus of the area planning process currently underway is to develop a network of viable and sustainable schools capable of delivering high quality education to our young people, uh, to our children and young people. The focus is not as often asserted to close rural primary schools. I have repeatedly said that I will not close schools just because they fall below the minimum enrolment threshold. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response. Um, can the Minister be specific and uh, respond by uh, advising if he will introduce a small schools policy uh, which will help address the, the needs of some of our smaller rural communities? Well, I will keep the matter under review, but I would be of the view that the sustainable schools policy is protection for small rural schools uh, in regards moving forward. And it clearly sets out a specific criteria for rural primary schools that urban primary schools do not enjoy. And it's worth noting that the, the definition of rural in the sustainable schools policy is everything outside Belfast City Council area and everything outside Derry City Council area. So it's a very wide definition uh, of, of rural uh, communities within that. So, the, the, the member may want to avoid having to make decisions about schools going in the future. May want to avoid having to come up with a decision which sees a school which is unsustainable, which cannot deliver educational well-being to the young people, closed down. It's never a nice decision to have to make, but it's the right decision to have to make, because the member surely agrees that young people in rural communities should have the same right to high-quality education as young people and urban communities should have. And whatever policy you come up with, uh, if it's a policy that is there to enshrine educational quality in it, then you have to set criteria on the basis of which a school is sustainable moving forward. Now, that's the only basis upon which I believe a policy should be set, that it is there to enshrine high quality education. Where a school falls below the ability to deliver high quality education, then I think the only right and the proper thing to do is to close that school. Mr. Declan Michaelier. Uh, could the Minister tell us what steps his department has taken to ensure that the needs of rural communities are fully met within the remit of his department? Well, in regards to rural proofing and developing the sustainable schools policy, DE consulted with the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development. The policy was also assessed against the Rural Development Council's rural proofing checklist, set in, out in its report striking the balance and no adverse impact was identified. Staff and DE's area planning team attended a rural proofing training course in December 2013 to help further inform, inform the considerations and decisions about rural schools in relation to area plans and their outworkings. And I also have no policy to close rural primary schools. I have a policy to ensure that we have high quality educational provision being delivered to rural and urban communities. Call Mr. Mervyn Story. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. One would be convinced that the Education Minister somehow uh, wants to blame everybody else, but is ducking the issue. And that is, when will he tell this House how many rural schools, under his current watch and in the next number of months, does he actually plan to close, particularly in the light of the review of his transport policy, 
which is based on distance to school, not on educational quality. And therefore, will the minister come clean and tell those many rural schools who are sitting at this minute in time worried about the future of the small schools factor in the common funding formula, worried about no schools policy, small schools policy, and worried about their long-term viability while he ducks and dives and tries to blame others? Well, let me spell it out quite clearly for the member. I don't blame anybody else. I'm the Minister for Education. I have responsibility for making decisions, and I make decisions. So I have, unlike the member on his party who don't make decisions, avoid decisions, and run away from decisions, I make decisions. And in relation to the number of schools that have been closed down under my watch, that information is accessible. In fact, I will provide the member with the information. I have no plans to close schools, a number of schools going into the future. Schools closures only come about as a result of the managing authority, whether that be the Education and Library Board, uh, the CCMS, or in the case of a voluntary school, the Board of Governors coming forward from that area, bringing forward a development proposal seeking the closure of the school. I then go into a two-month consultation period with all interested parties. I gather evidence, tech, verbal, and written evidence from communities affected, and only then do I make a decision as to whether a school should or should not close. But if I'm not convinced that a school can continue to provide high-quality education to the young people it serves, then as Minister of Education, I'm duty-bound to make the decision to close it. Call Mr. Tom Elliott. Question number seven, Principal Deputy Speaker. The provision of a new school to facilitate the amalgamation of Victoria Royal Academy and Anniskill and Collegiate was one of the 22 projects announced in January 2013 to be advanced in planning. Funding for the project cannot be confirmed until an approved economic appraisal is in place. Work on an economic appraisal cannot begin until the size of the new school building has been confirmed. The development proposal process will confirm the size of the new building. The Western Education Library Board have advised that consultation on the development proposal process has commenced. Mr. Elliott, for a supplement. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that. Can the Minister give, us, or give me any assurance uh, that there will be no proposal to amalgamate or no further work on the amalgamation until there is certainty over a new build? and that the proposal for the new build will actually have commenced to a significant degree uh, before the amalgamation can or would take place? Well, as I have outlined to the member, uh, to follow that pathway means that nothing happens, because there has to be a development proposal process for me to be able to move into the economic appraisal process to decide, to decide what well, the development proposal will tell me what size the school will be in terms of the number of pupils attending. You would then move forward to an economic appraisal basis on the terms of cost of providing such a school, if agreed, moving into the future. So I think uh, we allow the Western Education Library Board to carry out their work. If and when they move to the publication of a development proposal, then it becomes uh, my responsibility, and I will listen to the concerns, views, uh, support, or against whatever the development proposal is at, this, at that stage, and then I will make a decision. If I make a decision to move forward for a new build, then there will be a responsibility on me to secure that new build. And it's as difficult as times we live in. We now are in a rolling program of new school builds moving into the future. Uh, so I think in terms of a surety around a new building program for Anna Skillner elsewhere, I can assure you that despite the difficulties we face, there's a rolling program of new school build programs uh, continuing. Mr. Phil Flanagan. Um, the, the Minister will be aware of the, the changing demographics within the control sector within Fermanagh and the need for um, changes to take place, particularly uh, to keep Devonish School, Devonish College sustainable. So, can the Minister give us an indication what approvals are required before the development proposal um, can be published? Uh, go on, break a slash and hold as a case. Well, as I've said, the, the relevant managing authorities, in this case the Western Education and Library Board, have to do a pre-consultation process. If the pre-consultation process and they're satisfied, they can move forward then to the publication of a development pr proposal. Uh, it's quite clear to any observer that there needs to be decisions made in the Fermanagh area, in the Anniskillen area, in relation to the entire controlled education sector. And for far too long, there has been a focus on one side of that uh, control sector are, are the needs of 
a number of schools within that control sector instead of looking at the entire needs of the, uh, those pupils wishing to attend control sectors within Fermanagh. It goes back to the earlier debate we were having about educational achievement and the well-being of education in Protestant working-class communities. If you only focus on a small section of society, then obviously uh, the significant part of society is going to drop behind. So, Western Education and Navy Board have to make a decision. I think there's a responsibility on elected representatives in the area to encourage them to come forward uh, with a development proposal, whatever that proposal may be, which secures the educational well-being of all the young people in Fermanagh in the control sector. Thank you. And that uh, ends the, uh, the period for oral questions, and we now move on to topical questions. And I call Mr. Ian Munn. Very much, good, uh, Pete Collier. I would like to ask the Minister, in light of the recent R uh, CRC report, uh, what steps he has uh, taken to break the link between poverty and poor education attainment? Um, as, as, thank the Member for his question. As outlined in responses to other questions, I have changed the common funding formula to direct more funding towards those schools dealing with higher levels of social deprivation. Uh, while money on its own is not the only answer to this question, it is quite clear that those schools facing such challenges require extra resources uh, to provide to their young people and more opportunities to provide to their young people. I have also mentioned, in terms of implementation of the entitlement framework, a greater funding towards uh, community projects for the first time on education. And the Department of Education, uh, over this last number of years, has been concentrating more on what's happening outside the school gates than within the school gates, because I believe the policies are right with inside the schools. We now need to ensure that communities' parents are supported to ensure that their young people can achieve all their educational or achieve their full educational potential. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer thus far. Uh, how much of an impact uh, does the, does the uh, continued use of academic selection have on exacerbating the kind of inadequacies uh, featured in this report? Uh, as uncomfortable as it is for some in this House to hear it, and others beyond this House to hear it, it is the single biggest factor, in my opinion, uh, holding back our education system. It is an inequality which requires to be challenged, not only by educationalists, but anyone who has an interest in equality matters in our society, uh, whether it be the trade union movements, the churches, or civic society need to come out and make a very firm position and campaign around ending one of the last social inequalities in our society, which divides 11-year-old children, not on the basis of their educational ability, but largely on the basis of their socio-economic background. And no other function in public services do we divide people up in such a manner. Uh, we don't, when people go into our, our hospitals, when they go in and seek services from any other of our departments, we don't establish their socio-economic background. In education, we do. And I think it's a disgrace that in the 21st century we are continuing this practice, which has been left behind by the vast majority of modern education systems throughout the world. Questions should be directed through the chair. Uh, members should listen rather than mutter when the answer has been given. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I, I'm fed up having to kind of repeat that information. People understand what the rules of this House is and let's abide by them. I call Maeve McLaughlin. Um, following the Minister's address at the INTO conference in Kilkenny, um, can I maybe ask the Minister to give us an update on the areas where there is progress in terms of uh, north-south uh, basis? Go and break this and, and hold it in case. Uh, I welcome the work that has been taken forward by the Department and the Department of Education and Skills to examine new and innovative ways of addressing educational achievement. Both departments face similar challenges, significant impact of socioeconomic factors and educational outcomes, multi-generational and cult cultural obstacles to realising the value of education and the need for long-term and strategic impact. Uh, both departments are working across a wide range of areas. I think one of, um, just to mention a few, the work between the both departments and inspectorates uh, has been progressing for many years and is paying dividends for both our education systems. The work of uh, the Middletown Centre in relation to autism has now uh, broken through 
the political suspicions around that program, program and is delivering highly respected uh, autism services on both sides of the border. Other programs of work which we are involved in are some of them are just uh, projects, weekly projects, or, uh, so for instance, Miles Weeks Ireland and Children's Books Ireland as well. But I'm pleased with the level of progress and cooperation between both departments moving forward, uh, and I believe it is paying dividends for children on either side of the border. Ms. McLaughlin, for supplementary. Gourmet, and can I thank the Minister for that, particularly in terms of the work that's done, I think, between the inspectorates, uh, both north and south. Uh, and I have to say, I'm pleased to say uh, that there is progress in relation to the Middletown Centre. Uh, I'm just asking the Minister now for guarantees that the Middletown Centre for Autism is now effectively on track and delivering high quality uh, programmes and initiatives uh, for people dealing with autism. Gourmet. Yes, uh, the Middletown Centre is now an integral part of our education system. Uh, it is delivering uh, to thousands of, of, of families uh, on either side of the border on an annual basis. It's, as I have said, its services are highly respected, uh, and we have long-term plans uh, for, by both departments to ensure that it continues to be so. I call Mr Dominic Bradley. While up the case to occur or not, a Indian chillum nor core solar forgan of Nua da skull niv is of a gross figlin on a kangal le cursi femur tashid in your kindra. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, could I ask the Minister, does he agree with me? that the provision of a new build for St Joseph's Cross Maglen should not be uh, contingent on or tied in any way to whatever happens in Uri City? Well, what the member is really saying to me is, Minister, build us a new school in Cross Maglen and I won't have to stand up to the grammars in Uri. That's what he's really saying. That is. And, and, and as I go back to my, 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 the question from, my, from the previous member, the, 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 the SDLP's policy is to oppose academic selection. So it is. Order. To oppose Order. academic selection. And the Newry area is a clear example of where it's having a detrimental impact. Where it is having a detrimental impact upon a wider area than simply Newry. And I can draw a line from Bam Bridge right to St Joseph's and Cross McLean and show you the impact that Newry is having on schools right along there. And I think there is a responsibility on the SDLP to live up to their policy commitment and stand up against academic selection. In relation to St Joseph's, I am on record as saying that St Joseph's requires a new build. I am also on record as saying that the numbers of schools requiring new builds uh, do not match up to the budget I currently have. I am working my way through proposals from the Education and Library Boards, the Voluntary Grammars and uh, CCMS. Uh, uh, the integrated sector and the Irish medium sector in relation to a number of new bills. I hope to be in a position to make announcements in regards to uh, new bills in the very near future. Um, the elections per to me get in my way of making that announcement. I'm still in discussions with my officials in relation to that matter. But I do hope to be in a position to make an announcement about a new bill programme in the near future. I have yet to finalise that list and I can assure the member that when that list is finalised I will inform those schools that have qualified this time. But as I have said to previous members during this question time, we are now in a rolling programme of building new schools and they are no longer one-off events or events every couple of years. We will be making regular announcements and moving them forward. I call Mr Bradley for a supplementary. I, I thank uh, the Minister very much for his answer, Grumila Mayogut uh, Ara. And uh, I um, refute the suggestion that the Minister is making that it is in some way the SDLP's fault uh, that uh, he hasn't moved yet to build a, a new school in Cross McLean. But I very much welcome uh, what he has said that he will uh, make an announcement uh, sometime possibly after. Uh, the election, and I very much hope that St Joseph's Cross Maglen will be on that list. Well, let me reassure the member, I'm not blaming him for the new school now being built in Cross Maglen. I'm blaming him for his party not moving forward on their policy, which would uh, assist in championing uh, an end of inequality 
and social inclusion in our society, which will ensure that all schools in our society are playing on a level playing field. But I can assure the member uh, I'm working my way through the various lists that have come in from the various bodies, and I will make my announcement as soon as possible. Yeah, and it comes to John Dallet. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm sure the, the Minister, along with other members of this House, would have been appalled at the tragic death of Anne Maguire in a school in Leeds. What implications is this, this for our schools, and what advice would the Minister be giving them? Well, can I, I may firstly offer my deepest sympathies to the family, uh, colleagues, uh, and friends of Anne Maguire, and indeed to the entire teaching profession. Uh, it was an absolute tragedy and a horrific way for anyone to lose their life, but particularly a teacher in a school, and by all accounts, a very, very highly regarded teacher uh, who worked for all our pupils. And the full circumstances of all that will come out in due course. But I don't want to be, and I'm not suggesting the member is, to be alarmist in regards to these matters. Um, it is, in, in terms of Britain, it's only the, the second such killing within a 20 year period. I think Dunblane was the, was the last circumstances, but we certainly want to do everything within our power to ensure the safety of all our teaching and school staff when they're in school premises. Each school will have their own health and safety uh, measures in place, but I have to say our schools continue to remain to be very, very safe places. There is occasionally valid incidences against teachers, against other pupils, etc. etc. There is sometimes verbal exchanges which go way beyond uh, the remit of acceptability and can put significant pressure uh, on our teaching and support staff within our schools, but our schools still do remain very safe places. Mr. Dallet for supplement. Uh, Mr. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, I concur entirely with the Minister that our schools are safe places and also that they should remain uh, open places. But the Minister will be aware that in addition to two people losing their lives in Britain, a 1,000 teachers were attacked, 550 pupils were expelled since 2011. And while I'm drawing no parallels uh, with, with uh, Northern Ireland, uh, would the Minister agree with me that teachers really do need reassurance that the school is a safe place? Well, I, I can assure the member that I continue to work with uh, teachers' unions and representative bodies in discussing any concerns they may have in relation to either a particular circumstances or a trend developing uh, within our schools. Of those valid incidents and suspensions, there will be an individual story behind every one of them. And our, our schools are a reflection of what's happening in our society at times. And society's problems and family problems and individual children's problems are not left at the school gates. They're brought into the schools with them. And the vast, vast majority of times our schools act as comfort zones uh, for those troubled uh, young people. But unfortunately, in these circumstances, it has been extremely and horrifically uh, wrong. But I can assure the member I continue to work with teachers' representatives to ensure that our, our schools remain safe places. Call Ms. Rosalind McCarley. Can I ask the Minister for an update on the Shared Education Campuses Programme under the Executives Together Building United uh, Community Initiative? Uh, I have recently the call for expressions of interest closed on the 31st of March. We had 15 expressions of interest uh, from various quarters. Uh, though they will all have to be assessed against the criteria, uh, and then I hope to be in a position to make an announcement later in the summer as to which have been successful, and we will move on to the next phase. Carly, for supplementary. And can I uh, uh, thank the minister for his answer? Um, can I also ask the Minister to provide an update on progress on the uh, flagship shared education project at Lisanelli? Um, as members will be aware, uh, the, the demolition of the old buildings on the site is well advanced. Um, we are now clearing the site in preparation for firstly the construction of the RVLE Special Needs School, which will be moving on to the site and will be the first school to be completed on the shared education campus. Uh, my department and the management bodies continue to engage on the way forward in relation to the actual planning of the school estate uh, on the Lisanelli uh, campus. And we are, I, I'm content with the pace at this stage as to how we are moving forward. It is quite a significant 
capital investment and indeed quite a significant infrastructure uh, we're, we're building on that site and it will present challenges as we move along but I, I am content at this stage that we're moving along uh, at proper pace. Order time is up.